Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another spoiler review episode here of the Shogun series, brought to you by the Outlaw Nation. I am the Outlaw himself, John Roca, joined as always by my friend and co-host on the Cinephiles, who's a master James Clavell historian and who has slowly grown in estimation by a number of the people in the Outlaw Nation for your incredible points of views and uh, analysis of these Shogun episodes, and that is my friend uh, Steve Morris. How are you, Steve? I'm good, thank you, and thank you to all the members of the Outlaw Nation. They are proud citizens of a wonderful country, so <laughs> I appreciate their praise. <laughs> yes, and of course, most of them cross over with the uh, Cinephiles Nation, which we appreciate as well. It's our main uh, uh, show that we do together as a podcast for about eight years. For those of you who may not know that, we do that. We break down one great movie every week, and sometimes we spread it out. Well, n now more often than ever, <laughs> we spread it out over multiple episodes uh, and go scene by scene through the movie. So if you're a huge movie cinephile addict uh that loves cinema our podcast is one for you we we average anywhere from 150 to 200,000 250,000 downloads a month sometimes a week depending on the episode so it's definitely a, a a a podcast that a lot of people enjoy and we dive into so many things and right now we're just wrapping up our season of Scorsese and we uh dropped our first episode the last temptation of Christ we'll drop our second episode this Friday, every Friday, you get a new episode. And if you join our Patreon there on the Cinephiles, you get uh, shorts, you get all kinds of things. Uh, you get to be part of the advisory council. Anyway, just big stuff over there in the Cinephiles um, over there. And we've also got our own YouTube channel. So if you don't want to see our pretty faces, you can just listen to us on YouTube uh, there as well. No, wait, that's reverse. If you want to see our pretty faces, you can watch us on YouTube talking about stuff as well. All right, I just wanted to throw that out there as we start this thing. Uh, Steve, let's get into this episode, episode eight of Shogun season one. I say season one because I don't know, man. We got two episodes left and there's still a lot to wrap up here. This one's called The Abyss of Life from director Emmanuel Ose Kufour and writer Shannon Goss. Steve, your overall thoughts on this one? We find out Toronaga's massive, massive big picture plan here that costs the life of one of his great advisors. And we see uh, Ishido and Ochiba getting closer and possibly unifying their bond in marriage here. So the piece is moving into place as we walk into the final two episodes of the season. But this being a setup for those final two episodes, what did you think of all that we got in this particular episode? First of all, lots of really, really, really dramatic stuff, particularly what you just mentioned, the death yeah. of Hiramatsu. Um, we've, we've diverged in lots of ways from the books. And so, mm. you know, it's, uh, it's constantly an adjustment for me to go, oh, here's my favorite thing in the book. Oh, that's not going to happen. Oh, this is this really beautiful scene. I like this a lot. Oh, they're doing this a different way. And in particular with this, yeah, because Tornaga has obviously, by the end, we realize has been playing a very long game. Yes, it, it actually fulfills things that are in the book, too. I don't know. I remember when we were first talking and there's the scene where the uh, Ochiba is watching the no drama, the play. Yes. And we yeah, were talking about actor, right, right. And we were talking about that samurai would act and also yeah. do tea ceremony and flower arrangement and calligraphy. And this is one I was waiting for. It's <laughs> like to see Torino. How do they handle Torinaga's performance? And I think they handled it beautifully. So th I think there was a lot of fun things in this episode and a lot of things that were very different from the book. Oh, good. All right. So I want to get into it. We're going to break it on down. Just letting you all know. Yeah, I like this episode a lot. Not a lot of action, if any at all, but there was a lot of action going on in the conversations, in the political maneuverings, and in some of the surprise and shocking and heartbreaking moments within this episode as well. So we're going to get into all of it and break it down. This is a spoiler review. So if you haven't watched the episode, go back and watch and come back and join us. But let's, I'm going to break it down into some sections here, Steve. So um, I'm going to do my best here to kind of uh solidify stuff into one into a couple of a few sections rather and get your responses on this we start off with the procession here essentially the funeral procession for nagakado Tor tornaga's son who of course uh died at the end of the last episode slipping on that rock and hitting his head here uh trying to kill seiki and it does not happen uh we see the tornaga is sick we hear that he is going to mourn for 49 days there in edo uh yabushigo yabushige rather says nagakado's death is quote lower than boiling but higher than eaten by dogs and make sure <laughs> To get people to write that down. Uh, Blackthorn tries to offer condolence to Tornaga, who kind of doesn't respond to him, even though he looks at him. He doesn't say anything. and moves on. Uh, and um, we see Mariko and Blackthorn have a conversation here. Mariko gives Blackthorn back his logs, says that uh, he doesn't have to go to Osaka with them since he no longer wants to stand up for them. And uh, Lady Fuji will take care of his estates, and he can be reunited with his men and probably move on. Um, and he, but she's not sure how Tornaga's successors will deal with him, which I think is a bit of a foreshadowing for anybody who knows the real history between 
these two characters. Um, uh, and he tries to get her to not go to Osaka and stay with him. And we see that in that opening procession here. So let's stop there real quick and we'll get to a bigger chunk in just a second. But I want to get your thoughts on this opening here. Is Obviously, this is not in the book because Nagakato does not die in the book. Uh, so what do you think of this intro here? 49 days, um, giving back the logs and uh, Blackthorn pleading for Mariko to go with him instead of going to Osaka and her saying no, that she has her loyalty to Toronaga. That is, she's devoted to, and Toranaga is ig ignoring of Blackthorn's condolences and then coughing and showing that he's sick. Your thoughts overall on this beginning? I think it's really interesting because, and it's always interesting when there's a divergence from the story, is that, the, the and to some degree, the result is the same, which is that in the book, uh, Toranaga agrees to go to Osaka, and then he just goes real, real slow and keeps getting <laughs> delayed, and there's illnesses, and there's all sorts of excuses, and then there's a rainstorm, and then he's, well, we'll get there eventually, you know? Mm -hmm. And because of the death of Nagakato, they've created a bigger reason mm -hmm. for uh, for the delay, which is we have these 49 days to mourn the death of his son, and I think what makes it stronger is that when you see sort of broken, sick Toranaga... Mm -hmm it feels connected emotionally to what just happened to his son. So yeah. like, you know, you're an actor as an actor, yeah. having a good motivation really helps you put in a better performance. And so I think <laughs> in that sense, we do, I, I, and I think the actor does a great job of, man, we go, this guy was just the toughest, coolest guy in the world. Yeah. And he just looks totally broken yeah. and it's really sad to watch. So I think in that sense, it's really effective in, in, in setting this stuff up. Yeah. What about the exchanges between Mariko and Blackthorn? We don't think one of the criticisms we had last episode, both of us are finally on the same page on this, that there's not enough of the romance being laid out here. And there still seems to be not enough of the romance being laid out, Steve. It seems to be in between the breaths or in between the lines, this connection that they have. Um, and he seems to kind of give in and want her to stay. Like he fully kind of admits his feelings for her in essence by saying, come with me, don't go to Osaka, stay with me. I want to be with you. And she says, no, I have my allegiance to Toronaga. That's where my duty lies and walks away from him or rides away from him. So your thoughts on this opening with those two as well? Well, it's just a totally different approach to the characters. Mm. And it, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad approach story wise. I mean, the, the, you know, yeah. the classics of even romantic stories is romantic stories are always, almost always about people in conflict, you know? Yeah. It's, right. You know, it's like, you don't just have, you know, like one of the, the, the problems with the Star Wars prequels is that you know, Anakin and Amidala, they just, we're just in love and we just say how in love we are and aren't we in love and isn't it great to be in love as opposed to Han and Leia where they're in constant conflict. Yeah, The constant yeah, yeah. conflict is so much better. So in, in that sense, this choice of Mariko and Blackthorn being really in conflict and yeah. it, 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 it is, is classic storytelling. It's not at all what happens in the book. And at this point, I'll, I'll reveal some more of it, which is that okay. in this journey... Uh, this slow journey to Osaka where they never quite, well, they do eventually get there. Yeah. Blackthorn and Mariko are having a long affair, sleeping together every single night, wow. totally 100% in love, speaking Latin to each other because it's the only language that nobody else understands. And it's just full romantic love. And so the tension in that sense isn't about will they, won't they, what's the conflicts between them, which is what yeah. we see in the series. Yeah. The tension in that sense is, oh shit, people are going to find out they're doing this is really really dangerous what's going to happen you know wow so, so yeah go ahead go ahead sorry finish your no, no, that, that, i was just saying so that yeah. is a really really different approach and yeah. it's different and it makes blackthorn's character very different it makes mariko's char character very different yeah. they the and, and frankly it makes and this is the criticism that i have as a lover a love of the book is it makes blackthorn less important less intelligent and less interesting in yeah which i still continue to feel in this episode, although this, this episode was definitely better for me than last. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on. Uh, let's see, later Yabushige, Omi, Buntaro, and others are talking, laughing, and offering tribute to Nagakato. Uh, there in his foibles when he was younger, Omi is upset that they are surrendering. He's clearly unsettled. Even though he was whispering, you know, uh, manipulative stuff into Nagakato's ear, it seems that he genuinely had an affection for his young friend, and the or his friend, rather, and the fact that he's gone now it kind of brings everything to light. And Obi is an interesting character in this particular episode, Steve, because not only is it the loss of Nagakato, it's also this feeling like, my God, we are going to surrender. Tornaga is going to surrender us. I don't want to end up dead or under Psyche's rule. Uh, and he sees that Kiku is already moving on 
to what's going to happen in Edo and she's going to stay and they're going to be courtesans. So a lot of Omi's world is starting to shatter right from underneath him. So he's an interesting character to watch, I think, as we go forward in the next couple of episodes here with him and what he does and how he reacts to things. Because even Yabushige, who has given his, his nephew almost no credit, says in the funeral procession, which we're going to get to in a second, like that uh, when they're actually burying Nagakato, that um, uh, he's right to want to storm Osaka and he actually wants to go with him to storm Osaka. So uh, I don't see a lot of reviewers covering Omi's storyline here, but I think it was bubbling below, below the surface throughout this entire episode. What did you think? I, no, I, as I've said many times, I love Omi. He's a great yeah. character. He's really smart, very observant. He's sort of the young generation of someone who could become a great leader. You Good know what point. I mean? Yeah. And, and so I've always liked him and I was a little confused and what I was trying. Ooh. So, we know that he manipulated Nagakata into killing the guy with the cannon. Yes. We, yes. we know that, di and he, we know that he was really unhappy that he couldn't go see Kiku, and then yeah. Kiku ends up sleeping with Toronaga's brother. Right. Did he manipulate Nagakata into going in onto this attack? Was this all Omi's idea? I wonder, because that hasn't been really laid out, and I wonder if they were both planning this, or did he encourage nagakato to do it so we haven't heard yet if the and, and omi has not said and i wonder if we will find out because it uh i guess if we don't find out we assume that it was nagakato's own ambition to do this because he didn't want to surrender and certainly throughout the episode nagakato's decision gets respected by just about everybody down the line except for toronaga who says nothing about it but yabushige respected it uh blackthorn respects it omi respects it so and some of the generals and are and, and even his military showing up to this funeral we should get to here wearing their armor in a way is respecting Nagakato's decision to try to kill Seiki and 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 turn the uh, tide on this thing. I mean, I don't respect it. I think it was a stupid mm. thing to do. I think okay. it was a dangerous thing to do. Um I and and I think the other element that's going on is there's respect for Nagakato and there's also disrespect for Toranaga's surrender, which mm. is also a key piece of all of this. Yeah. Um Quickly on Omi, I yeah. don't. The, the reason I asked that question is I don't understand his reaction. It, it didn't like it. Mm. If he had, if we knew that he encouraged Nagakata to do this thing that led to his death, then oh, it could be feelings of guilt, right, and things like that. But we don't really know that. I didn't feel like he was that close to him, and so this sort of crisis of confidence he's having at this moment yeah. doesn't quite make sense to me. But mm. the, you know, the loving of the warrior element of Nagakato's character and yeah. the. And all of that stuff, and uh, in contrast to Toronaga, who's choosing not to act, I think yeah. I think is working really well. Yeah, agree. As I say, we go to the funeral, and Nagakato uh, cannot attend. Yabushige wants to march on Osaka, as I said. The generals wear their armor in protest. Mariko later talks with Lady Ochiba's sister and plays with the baby. She informs her, Lady Ochiba's sister does, that her family will be spared by Shido and Ochiba. Then Buntaro interrupts and asks Mariko to have tea with him. Blackthorn meets up with Father Martin. They have a back and forth about getting his ship, but God, he's so obsessed with his ship, and that he's going to see his crew again. And Father Martin gets a little passive-aggressive dig at him, saying, you're going to wear those clothes when you see your crew, which I think bears fruit. And then Father Martin meets up with Tornaga and tells him that the Christian Council members will not side with Tornaga. Tornaga is not happy. Martin suggests an alliance with Ochiba. Toronaga says, there's no way that's going to happen because Ochiba doesn't like him. Uh, and then Toronaga tells Hiramatsu to stop questioning his decision when Hiramatsu tries to push him to fight and asks for all these people to sign an obedience letter to him. Uh, and then he gives Father Martin uh, land in Edo at the end to build the church, which we find out later uh, will be right next to Jin's um, tea houses, quarters, brothel places, or what have you. And it seems to me a final fuck you to send him to Ishido with a letter as well uh, telling Ushido that uh, Toronaga wants to die in peace here uh, after the death of his son. So your thoughts on how the Father Martin situation goes down here with both Blackthorn and uh, Toronaga. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically, basically, what's your feelings on Father Martin coming in after a few episodes here? So first of all, it's a later scene, but just because you brought it up, yeah, putting the church next to the brothels, <laughs> love it. That's yeah. not in the book. That was oh, brilliant. Is. No, oh, not in the book. It was brilliant as soon as I saw it. I was like, oh, what a great little bit of shade to throw <laughs> on the church. Um, that was really cool. Yeah. Um, I, uh, again, I love Toronaga's performance at pretending to be sicker and weaker than he is. Yes. What I don't understand. So, so to be to spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. Here well, it's a spoiler review. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Hiromatsu's going to commit seppuku. Yeah, at the end, near the end of the episode, and then we later discovered that that was really all part of the plan. Yeah, that 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 he had to do that. If that's the case, why does Hiromatsu come out of that meeting saying to all the other generals, "Oh, Tornog is totally not going to surrender because yeah. he would never send the priest with the message to Osaka if he was actually going to go to Osaka." Yeah, that is the antithesis of what Tornog is trying to do because Tornog is trying to look weak. Yeah. So Hiromatsu calling him out at that moment, unless he doesn't know that he, that unless he's not in on it at this point and is in on it later, yeah. Or uh, if he's, or he could be never in on it, and Toronaga yeah. just manipulated it in, into killing himself because that's what he needed him to do. Well, it feels like he is in on it from what the yeah. exchanges are with uh, Mariko later in the episode. So we should talk about that since you brought it up. Let's let's address it. Yeah, I, I think this uh, decision has been. They've been working on this for a while. That they had this as a possibility, right? And and um, Nagakato's death basically bought them extra time to do what they needed to do here and, and put this in motion, right? So I do think uh, Hiramatsu was in it for the beginning. And I think what he tells the generals is this idea that Toronaga is going to fight. So they stay resistant to the surrender. So that when they go into that final council meeting, you see that they're still hyped up. They still don't want to go. And that leads to the back and forth with everything. And so that when Hiromatsu ends up chiming in to defend the generals and the other military people who are there and advisors who don't want to surrender, the fact that um, Toronaga essentially plays chicken with Hiromatsu for, and then Hiromatsu calls him out on his bluff and, and, and commits seppuku, it shows the other generals and the military leaders like he is absolutely 100% committed so the only person I think you could really trust was Hiromatsu with that secret. Everyone else, though, is going to talk to their spies and talk to their people, and it's going to get back to Ishido and Ochiba that, yes, Toronaga is absolutely committed to this surrender. And the so he killed the one, so the one person sacrificed himself who would know his actual plans, and he iced them out. And Jin, who had guessed at his plans, he gives Jin that, Jin that land, and I think that's her, his way of buying her silence. So I think this was all done so that the generals themselves pass on the word to Ishido that Toronaga is committed to the surrender. That, that's what I think. No, I think that's exactly right and exactly what happens. Let me ask mm. you for, before yeah. I answer, because this is different from the book. Yeah. How did you feel about this? Oh, man, I was heartbroken. Uh, I was so mad, and I bought it. I bought it. I totally bought it as a viewer. Even though Jin had said last episode uh, that you've got another plan, I know you do, I was like, well, where are we going? Because again, I haven't seen the series in forever. I haven't read the book. I've never read the book, so I hadn't seen the series in forever. And I was just like, okay, what's going to happen here? And as you said last episode, the tor the uh, Nagakato death is not in the book. So I was like, well, what are they doing here? How are they going to play with this? And so to me, I had bought all this and I kept saying to myself, why won't he fight? Why is he giving up? Is it the death of his son? What has this really affected him? And then when Hiromatsu, who is one of the, I mean, good hearted people, and certainly they spent time last episode showing you how much he has cared for this for uh, Tornaga uh, for Tornaga for so long, I, I thought to myself, "Wow, his obsession with not wanting to get uh, his obsession with wanting to have his laws and his word followed has pushed him to this moment." And the fact that they showed the seppuku all the way through, brother, cutting off the head, having it roll towards Nagakato, I was just like, oh, "Wow, I don't know where we're going now. This is madness," you know. So that's and did you I, did you kind of hate Tornaga a little bit? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Like, what are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it was weird for me to watch because this isn't okay. what's in the book. Oh, and I'll tell okay. you, and I'll tell you Alex. what's in the book. And yeah, Hiromatsu lives in the book. So <laughs> what? The two, two episodes, two characters, both of whom are it, you know, are there to the end. What? So, <laughs> he lives in the book? Yeah. Oh so, man. Oh, no, wow. but there is definitely this time. Yeah, and, and Nagakata's not dead, so there's no mourning, but there is definitely this time yeah. where Toranagas just seem to have lost it and he's uh indecisive and he's depressed and he mm. snaps at people and everyone's like oh man he's this is really going on yeah and the things that he does is first uh and i believe it's the the sister of ochiba that yeah uh, mariko's talking to that's yeah. actually the the wife of his eldest son who's the guy who's like the next in oh. the chain of command okay who is like a rigid sort of automaton like the opposite of nagakata just completely calm does exactly what tornaga says not brilliant but very steady have we and met him we haven't met him yet no no, no he's okay. not he hasn't been in the show at all he's in the okay. book okay. and um they 
there's a moment where someone like Buntaro or someone has come to the son and said, hey, maybe you should take over for your dad. Maybe he's not up to Ooh. being the leader anymore. Right. And Toronaga brings his son in and says, did you listen to this? He said, yes, I did. And you didn't tell me right away? No. Okay, go kill your children immediately. Wow. And he goes, okay. And his wife is there. And they send off the kid. They go to find the kids. And the wife is sitting there crying, you know, waiting for her husband to come back, having killed oh, their kids. Shit. And he comes back and says, I couldn't find the kids because Tornaga had grabbed them ahead of time because this was a test. <laughs> wow. Then when he calls all the generals in. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. When he calls all the generals in, uh, he does exactly what happens. And there are generals who say, yeah, we can't trust you right now. We think you should step down. Yeah. And he tells those generals to go out and kill themselves, which they do. Whoa. But not Hiramatsu. And that his reasoning is that he needs to make sure that he has perfect obedience. And those guys, if they were wavering then, they were going to yeah. waver later and betray him. Right. So it's it's not that he takes out his most loyal dude in order to convince everybody he's serious. He he and he uses the whole situation to take out his least loyal dudes and test everybody else's loyalty. So that that's what happens. In the what what yeah. a complete reversal! So yeah. then I have to ask you: Did you like the way? This decision was made for the story that they're telling in this particular adaptation. Well, it's dramatic as fuck. I mean, you know, like the whole sequence and with Buntaro having to, to cut the head yes. off his father yeah. and all of that. And it was super emotional. And I'm the whole time I'm going, shit, are they really going to, are they really going to do this? And then as soon as it's like, fuck, we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and, and of course I know that this is an act because I, I know that right. on some level we're going to get to where it's an act. So I'm like, right. I, I, it both impresses me with Toronaga yeah. and, but in, I, now I hate him, you know, to, so there's some part of me that's like, did you really have to kill that guy? Like, like, yeah. is that the only way you could achieve this goal? Like it, 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 I, I wonder how my feelings about him at the end, because at the end of the book, even though he's made some difficult decisions, you're like, yeah. go dude, you're awesome. Right. But I don't know that I'm going to ever feel that way again after that moment. For me. You, know, it's, you know, it's funny. We're in the midst of our discussions about Last Temptation of Christ, and and one of the things you hit on that was a really fun thing to monitor as we as we discuss that movie is: Would you follow this guy after he does a certain thing? Uh, and that's been a prevalent conversation we've had in the last two episodes of it. And it's kind of the same thing here: Would you follow uh, Nagakato after, or sorry, Tornaga after seeing him seeing him do the things that he was doing here? Yeah. And it's a good question. It seems like you might not. Yeah, it's yeah. um. And you might well, turn and this is, yeah. Well, I mean, and this is like we're talking about different cultures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and we're talking right. about a culture that has, at this time, as constructed in this show, a different yeah. relationship to death, a different relationship to duty and honor. Yeah. And so, to some degree, like you have to judge it on a different scale. Mm -hmm. But in another way, humans are humans, and cruelty is cruelty. Right. And like you're going to have to really conv you have more to convince me of why Tornaga was right to do this why uh, it was necessary than right. I think you did before that's my feeling at this moment yeah yeah it's a great point but i mean like i imagine the writers made this decision because of wanting to make a dramatic moment here uh and throw the audience back on its feet and, and it then, is yeah they're going to go yeah. and then we'll see as you said we'll see how they make sense of this in the next two episodes and make it feel like by the end that you felt like Tornaga did the right thing. Right. Um, yeah. Which will be interesting. Um, okay. Anything on father Martin and these interactions with Blackthorn and with uh, Tornaga, anything you want to add in or that was different from the book or that you found appealing before we move into the tea scene, which I think you should talk about. Yeah. Let's talk about the tea scene. All right, let's do it. All right. So we, we'd say, as I said earlier, Buntaro has asked Mariko to, to have tea with him. I, uh, such an interesting request. Uh, and when this tea scene begins, we can immediately tell by the physical movements that Buntaro is much more of the submissive in this situation, which is something we've never seen, a color we've never seen a Buntaro with Mariko. Uh, and he is preparing the tea. We see this whole ceremony. And as Steve said earlier, how Shogun were, or, or sorry, samurai were trained to do this. And we heard about how difficult it is to become a, and how, how long you have to study to become a tea server. And we were seeing the stuff with Kiku. So he makes the tea from Rico. He is so loving and careful. Uh, at, and then he talks about their younger days and how he remembers when they got together and he looks back on them with such fondness. And she says, I can barely even remember them. And then he asks for them to die together that he's willing to give her her wish now in a double suicide to protest the surrender. 
but she refuses because he doesn't get it that she wants to she wanted to die to get away from him and she'd rather live a thousand years rather than die with him and then walks out leaves him there and essentially in a puddle of tears afterwards so this was a surprise this was almost as surprising as the uh the uh Haramato scene man what did you think of this scene so up to up to the end of the tea ceremony and mm. the final argument at the end yeah. I thought the scene was beautiful. Yeah. I, I I really I was genuinely moved by it. I yes. loved seeing this other side of Buntaro. I love you could see the attention to detail he was doing. You could see how careful he was. And you could see, and this is exactly what's in the book, of Mariko going, This is the you know, like he's doing this amazing thing. Like yeah. her, you know, like yeah. genuinely, this is a beautiful tea ceremony. And in the book, she's genuinely, genuinely touched by his artistry. Those last lines from Mariko, that is. I, it's not, it, it doesn't seem right. Her character, because oh. she said this whole time it, she wanted to die because of what her father did yeah. and he prevented her. And now just straight up saying, actually, it's, that's not what it was at all. I really just hate you and want I'd rather be dead than be around you yeah. is like, and of course I don't like Buntaro. I mean, Buntaro is not a fun guy. He's an abusive you know? guy. Yeah. Yeah. Physically but, but, and, uh, and uh, verbally. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is not meant to excuse that in any way, Right. but he genuinely loved this person and he genuinely like in his mind is doing this thing to keep her alive. Yeah. And then she just put, give, you know, is completely cold and uh, harsh with him yeah. from that point forward. Which, again, not excusing his behavior at all, but her, her having those words, I, it just, it doesn't ring true to me for her character, particularly with mm. all the talk about loyalty and duty. And her whole system is based on that. And she is loyal or supposed to be loyal to her husband on some level. And that's, right. so I don't know that, I don't know how you felt about it, but for me, it just was, it came off way harsher than I felt was made sense for her character. Uh, I liked it because she is growing in power and growing in her voice. And I think the romance for lack of a better term, with Blackthorn is opening her eyes up to the possibility of more in her life, a loving relationship to cu coupled with her advancement in court, coupled with her uh, having favor with Toranaga. So I think this is a slow, quiet, silent progression of her becoming stronger and stronger every episode. And I don't think this is what he would have, what she would have said to him four episodes ago, but I think mm. where she's at now in her life and where they're on the precipice of surrendering in essence. Cause she doesn't know what the plan is yet. Um, she's just like, fuck it. I'm in this place now where I don't have to adhere to this kind of stuff. I don't have to play your dutiful wife. I don't have to do any of this. And the fact that you think that I would, I would kill myself for you. Like, how can you not get what is going on here? So I thought it was great and I enjoyed it. And I thought it fit what they were, what they've been doing with her uh, for every episode progressively throughout this series my question actually was more that I, that the buntaro actions didn't fit to me the how caring mm. and loving he was because we've seen none of that throughout the whole series yep. so yeah. for me it was kind of shocking to see him do this but in essence isn't this how an abusive relationship is the totally. person always comes back and says oh, i'm gonna change or tries to use the soft words and when a person finally has had enough there's nothing you can say to get them back with you uh, and I thought that's why I kind of liked the scene. It was a I, modern, it was a, a period approach to a modern uh, thing. And seeing the way she reacted, I thought was a modern approach to that kind of a situation set in a period piece. I think that's yeah. a great point. And I, I think you're, I, I think that's exactly what the intention of it was. Probably. And, and, yeah. and, and I think, and I think in that sense, it really, it really works. And I, mm. I hadn't framed it quite the way that you did. And I really liked the way you framed it. Mm. But again, this also brings up to me like, the problem with having such a weak Blackthorn is that if we had seen yeah. scenes over the Great last points. many episodes where he and Mariko are connecting and yeah, she, whether yeah. she makes her laugh or, or he tells her things about his world or his perspective yeah. that makes her learn a thing or consider a thing in a different way. Right. That, you know, because if, if, because, and this is what's not happening in this show, really, it mm. happens a little more in this episode than it has previously. But what should be happening is that Blackthorn is learning about the world of Japan and coming to have great respect for it and yeah. understanding and learning all these ways that it's better than his way of doing things. And at the same time, Mariko and Tornaga learning more from Blackthorn yeah. and him being the teacher that has, you know, his own perspectives and own things to say that teach them things. And that direction isn't happening at all. 
you know, yeah, I think that's, none of that going on. That's such an excellent point, Steve. Certainly we touched on the last episode. I think you're absolutely right. Even more so in this episode, like we need to see why she's in love with him. We yeah. need to see what it is about him. That is so interesting. So attractive. So cool. There are almost no moments other than him going after Buntaro after he's beaten her up or saving Tornaga from the, from the earthquake in essence. We've seen those moments, um, but we don't see the moments where who he is as a person is what's making. I mean, I would believe Fuji was more in love with him than Mariko because of the domestic stuff they had in those interactions yeah. and conversations. That seemed to be more believable than the Mariko stuff with him. So we are handed this romance, and both the actors, Cosmo and Anna Sawai, are doing a fantastic job yeah. with the material they're given, of course. But I agree with you that I feel like there needs to be more scenes where we understand why they are in love. We, I understand Tornaga keeping his distance. He's looking at the bigger picture. It's about Japan, not about him. But her and him need to have, uh, I mean, Mariko and Blackthorn need to have those moments where we see why she's in love with him and why she'd be willing to risk a samurai's anger uh, and, and violating her loyalty in order to um, pursue this relationship with, with Blackthorn. So yeah, yeah, yeah. good point. Um, all right, well let's, let's you know what? I'm gonna take a quick break, Steve, and then we'll jump into the last uh, segments of the uh, of the review here uh, right after this. All right, let's uh, let's get into the stuff here with Blackthorn and his crew. Um, he has led to the stinkiest part of town. Told of their drinking, carousing, runs into Solomon there, who is trying to you know. Uh, I don't know, curry favor with a young woman and have sex with her again, it seems like. Uh, he tells him that only six men are left and they all thought he had died, so they just committed to the decadent life. Um, and then he calls out Blackthorn's seeming ambition, accusing him of leading them into this place for his own ambitions, his own wealth, looking at the way he's dressed, um, which uh, ends up pissing off Blackthorn and he beats this guy up. He, it seems that he almost beats him to death uh, in this situation. And this leads him to go and ask for an alliance with Yabushige that he will fly under Yabushige's banner if he can get him his ship. Yabushige rejects this offer. Um, and Mariko and him tell Blackthorn that their loyalty to Tornaga supersedes any kind of death. Um, plus, Yabushige seems to still think that Tornaga is going to fight. And then Blackthorn confesses that he has no real home here. So your thoughts on this real quickly what happened here in these in, in this in these scenes i find it it's weird so mm. i'll tell you what happens in the book which is he goes to see his men it's mm. they're similar thing they're in a crappy part of town they yeah. are sleeping with you know low class prostitutes and drinking themselves silly and it stinks and there's fleas but what actually happens is they're happy to see him for oh. the most part there's some yeah. conflicts within the crew and obviously some resentment of him and he pretends that he's having a good time for as long as he can possibly stomach it and then goes away and basically strips naked to guess he's covered knows he's covered in fleas wow. and walks out in a loincloth much more like a samurai yeah you know um and so the, and no beat down there's no beat down that occurs so in essence he is shedding himself of those guys by walking out symbolism wise walking out in a loincloth right. from that experience interesting okay because he's come, become so much more japanese at this yeah. point in the in the book and, yeah. the, and the other thing though is that blackthorn in the book despite the fact that he doesn't really like hanging out with these filthy guys anymore who don't yeah. bathe and have all these bad manners from his the ways that he's changed but he has a deep deep sense of loyalty to them and mm. a sense that he of of responsibility to get them home so like mm, he goes like right. I don't like being around these guys, but I'm the I'm the leader. I have to take care of them. That's my job. Right, and that's totally different from what we see happen in this yes. episode. Where yes. because it's not just you know the guy takes a swing at him and they fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. It's the extra swings when the guy's down. Yeah, that says a whole other thing about what's going on with Blackthorn. You know. Yeah, and 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 I've got to I've got to come to an issue with this because like I was listening to the podcast, the company, which is great, the podcast that a company because they always get people who are involved with the writing, production, or direction, or acting in the in the show. And one of the writers was on. I can't remember the writer's name, but they were talking about this. That the reason they approached this with Blackthorn is they essentially want to turn him into the colonialist. He's going to represent the colonialist approach, the white colonialist approach, which I understood at the beginning of the series. But as we've become more and more connected to him and like him and enjoy him and don't see him trying to necessarily overcome Japan and do all these negative things. I don't understand 
why you're having him do these things that make you not like him. Like I and I think they're trying to make it seem like oh he's a colonialist white colonialist person we shouldn't like him but I think it's an error to the story that you're having him do these things because him beating up one of his own men who has been sitting here with no knowledge of what's going on instead of being an understanding person or a caring person or trying to check in with him or going in there because he refuses to go in there as well uh, all of that I thought was a massive mistake and spoke ill of Blackthorn rather than. Him going with his men, seeing what they'd become, realizing what he had been, and saying, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. There's a there's a better life I can have here in Japan. I choose that life over this life, and I'm going to sneak out and do the Irish goodbye and not say goodbye to anybody and get on out of here. I think that would have been the better move. And once again, it would have made us care about him more so that we can understand why Mariko cares about him. You know? So, yeah, I thought that was a bit of a curious decision by the writers to have him do this you know I, so. I, it, it's so i so honor what they're doing by elevating all the japanese stories sure. and giving sure. them i think that's absolutely fantastic but i don't understand why they're doing it at the cost of blackthorn and yes of yeah. course there would be less blackthorn because you it's you know you only have so much time that's totally fine right but in toranaga's mind in the book it's like if you're playing a chess game mariko's the queen yeah and blackthorn's like a bishop He's a really he and and mm. in this show, he's like a pawn. Yeah. And and a fairly unwilling, undependable, irascible, irrational pawn. Yeah. You know, instead of like someone who's really dangerous and really valuable. Right. And and in particular, the choice to go that, that, that he brings Mariko to translate him. He's already he said screw you to Toronaga publicly, which yes. is totally you know a, a big move and then he brings mariko who he knows is loyal to toranaga mm. to hey come translate you while i choose to betray toranaga publicly with this other guy yeah that just seems like a dumb yeah. and b like i don't like has blackthorn learned nothing about this society at this point like what mm. you know and he seems and and this is how he expresses himself and i think the actor does a good job of just going like i'm a character who's lost i don't know what to do yeah. at this yeah. moment you know yeah. i'm desperate and lost yeah um yeah hmm. it's an interesting thing for sure and then later we should wrap up the whole this section later he shows up after hiramatsu which we just discussed so a few minutes ago so if, if you're uh we talked about it all so i don't know if there's more to add here about him performing seppuku other than we get the idea that this was the this was supposed to shock us as viewers um but later mariko talks to tornaga we find out that blackthorn that he knew Blackthorn was going to turn to Yabushige. Yabushige and Blackthorn form this alliance because Yabushige now sees after the death of Hiramatsu that uh, Toranaga is going to give up. So he is going to now indulge his warrior impulses with Blackthorn, form this uneasy alliance uh, on his ship, on the Erasmus, and Mariko shows up on this ship as well after she has had this conversation with Toranaga where she realizes what Toranaga's overall plan was seeing him struggle with his tears as he talks about Hiromatsu and that it was all about trying to get this in motion so that Ishida would buy that he was uh, actually surrendering himself. And so she goes onto the ship and is going to be with Yabushige and uh, Blackthorn uh, as they head on off to wherever they're going here uh, in the next episode. So um, did you like the way those storylines kind of wrapped up and led to where we were at here by the end of the episode on the ship? I love the scene with her and Toronaga and Toronaga. First of all, I, I think he, again, great actor, plays it beautifully. Yeah. The, yeah. the reveal of his strength and the reveal that this was an act and yeah. simultaneously his deep, deep sorrow at what he had to do, I think that's played really well. And I love the moment where she realizes that he's acting and then he mm. says, are you ready? And she goes, I'm ready. Yeah. And that's great. I think yeah. that I think that's beautifully done. And her showing up on the ship is really, really well done. It's interesting in the book, a bunch of people sort of start to figure it out on their own. Oh, wait a minute. Why did Toranaga and Mariko, I believe, is one of them. And one of them, I think, is Omi's wife, who's a very smart and interesting character who's like, hey, Toranaga's messing with you. That's not this can't be right. This doesn't <laughs> add up. Um, so that, that's kind of, it's a, but, uh, you know, it's the difference between what you can do in a book, which is a whole bunch of different characters having their own internal experience yeah, yeah, yeah. and in a show where you set everything up for one moment and Mariko saying, I'm ready. Yeah. That's a, that's a different experience. And I think they handled it really well. Yeah. And Toronaga has that final scene, uh, finally visiting his son's, in essence, his son's grave 
where they had burnt him uh, and thanks him for inadvertently buying in time. Um, but he has lost his son and his closest advisor. So I imagine this is where Blackthorn maybe in the next two episodes will become more of a presence around Toronaga because that's how the story goes from what I understand. And I watched a bunch of YouTube videos detailing what actually happened between these two actual men mm. in the history of Japan. And so he does become a trusted advisor of Toronaga's going forward. So, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, there are definitely things that I'm the the, you know, the the big dramatic thing that I was wondering about, and at some point I will tell you what it was. I'm yeah, pretty please. sure that it did. But you, you want me to tell you now? It's, no, no, I'm don't ruin sure. it now. <laughs> I'm I'm nine with each episode. I'm more and more certain that they're never going to do it. Wow. Uh, so I will tell you near the end. Yes. But I'm fairly certain I know what's going to happen to oh. some of our characters going forward. Okay. But the way in which they're going to get to it, I think, is going to be real different. So we'll okay. see like how we get there because. You know, it's it's just funny. We're moving in the same direction. We're heading off to Osaka. Yeah. But exactly how it's going to go down, I don't really know. <laughs> um, all right, and then one last thing. We should talk about what happens in uh, in Osaka there. Ishido is prematurely enjoying the downfall of, uh, of Toronaga with Lady Oshiba and crediting her for the scheme. He pushes a step too far with the compliments and plays overplays his hand, asking her for her hand in marriage so they can make their union public. She doesn't give him an answer, and he goes, oh, well, why don't you think about it? Let me know. Uh, but then <laughs> la later, Lady uh, Dayuin, I hope I'm saying that right, the Daiko's widow, she suffers a stroke, and in her dying wish, she tells Ochiba to release the hostages and stop these games that are uh, uh, threatening to destroy Japan. And then near the end of the episode, and we don't see, Ochi we don't know how to read Ochiba's reaction. She's very stone-faced. And near the end of the episode, Ochiba seems to be accepting Ishido's marriage proposal. So what are your quick thoughts on all of this here as we wrap up our reviews? Too? I think I think they've done a great job setting up what is Ochiba as the wild card. You yes. Know? Yeah. Like we don't know that that the direction that she goes is going to be is going to make a big difference in the direction of the future of Japan. So yeah, I think they've done a good job setting that up. Yeah, we don't know what her issues are fully with um tornaga so i hope more of that maybe reveals itself and yeah now as you said wild card's a great way to put it she's the taiko's dying uh wife says this to him or her like stop don't do this anymore so is her going with ishido to go through the marriage a a, a scheming plot of her own to figure out which side she's going to play when the mo when the critical moment hits so i think the fact that we don't know. It makes her an interesting character as we move into these next two episodes to see how this is all going to turn out. Because there's nothing better than Shin Shido's shocked face when he loses it all to Toronaga, which I imagine is going to happen. So, um, all right. Anything else, Steve, that we didn't cut? I, this was a little bit longer than we usually go. So, uh, any anything else we didn't touch on that you want to make sure we hit on this episode? No, I, I think it's a really good, and I think it, it definitely there is a real sense of anticipation for what's going to happen next. So, I'm excited about yeah. that. Yeah, I agree. Same thing. And I thought uh, the cinematographer in this episode, Mark uh, Laliberte, did a wonderful job. A uh, very gray, very gloomy, very dark kind of episode. But I think that reflects what's going on here with everybody uh, involved in the uh, in the show and then where we're going to go in these next two episodes. Because the next episode is called Crimson Sky. That's the title. So we will see what that leads to for sure. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for joining us for this spoiler review of episode eight of the season one of Shogun. Big, big special thank you to my co-host, Steve Morris, here on these reviews and my co-host on the set of Steve, where they can they find you and our wonderful show? They can find me at SR Morris. It's Cine-Files is the name of the show, in case you need to know, F-I-L-E-S. Uh, and it is on all of your podcasting apps, all of the platforms. If you're on Apple Podcasts and want to subscribe there, that'd be great. And yeah. you can also uh, subscribe to our bonus feed where you can listen to Cinephile Shorts and have ad-free versions of the show there. You can also go to patreon.com slash the Cinephiles, as you mentioned at the top of the show. Yeah. And it's Cine underscore files on Twitter. And it's the Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. There you go. As for me, at the Roka says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch. And please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel down below. Hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button so you see content just like this that pops up and lets you know that we're doing it here on the channel. All right, leave us all your comments down below. Hit a like on this video, share it on your social media, and we'll see you next week with another brand new spoiler review here of Shogun on the Outlaw Nation. Peace until then. Mm -hmm.